Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this webinar organized by the Center for Market Education and the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, good evening for those of you that join us from uh, Asia, Southeast Asia in particular. Good morning for the guests from the United States. And good afternoon if someone is there from Europe. So we are collecting the whole continents and the whole time, possible time zones. Uh, this is the first webinar that we organize uh, this year, and we are very pleased, first of all, to have Mercatus Center uh, to be our partner in this event. Uh, and so this gives me the occasion to confess that our name is strongly inspired by Mercatus and by the experience that Mercatus is doing in terms of research and theoretical approach. And Obviously, I'm very pleased and honored to have here uh, with us uh, Professor uh, Karen Vaughan, that for those of you that has an interest in Austrian economics is a sort of legend and authority in the field. Uh, at least myself, uh, uh, so somehow I've been driven into an interest in uh, Ludwig Lachmann and uh, uh, the approach that Ludwig Lachmann uh, developed thanks to the writings of uh, Professor Vaughan and Professor Pricitko uh, in particular. So these uh, uh, two economists have driven somehow and set my research uh, uh, agenda. Um, so uh, Professor Vaughan, uh, for, for giving a short introduction, currently is Professor of Economics at George Mason University in Virginia, where she was also chair of department between 1982 and 1989. Uh, she has been in the past the president of the Southern Economics Association and the Society for the Development of uh, uh, Austrian Economics. She is an Austrian economist, specialized in Austrian economics and political economy, but with a strong uh, interest in uh, economic thought and uh, economic methodology, which I believe are disciplines that are strongly interconnected with theoretical economics. Pro probably they should and must uh, work together, but uh, over the years, there has been a gradual and radical separation and division uh, between these uh, disciplines. Um, Professor Vaughan uh, started her career as a, a mainstream economist, neoclassical economist. And uh, during uh, the conversation of this evening, she will explain how she was uh, dragged into Austrian uh, economics <laughs> for her good or for her bad, <laughs> for, the, for history to be said. So, um, but we are very much interested in understanding her theoretical and intellectual path, uh, the author that inspired her, how she developed uh, the, um, the research program that uh, somehow uh, was uh, brought out a series of papers that are now available and collected uh, into this book. So you can see essays on Austrian economics and political economy that has been recently published by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And before we enter uh, the topic of our discussion, I would like to give the stage to Ms. Jessica Karsh uh, for an introduction. She's the Associate Program Director of Academic and Student Programs at Mercatus Center. And she will give us an introduction about the activity of the center itself. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so as Carmelo said, my name is Jessica Cargis, and I'm an associate program director with the academic and student programs team at the Mercatus Center. As a university-based research center, the Mercatus Center advances knowledge about how markets work to improve people's lives by training graduate students, conducting research, and applying economics to offer solutions to society's most pressing problems. At Mercatus, Professor Karen Vaughn, is an Emeritus Distinguished Senior Fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for the Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, a program that supports scholars who work at the intersection 
of the Austrian Virginia and Bloomington Schools of Political Economy. We are proud to support and help publish Karen's latest book, Essays on Austrian Economics and Political Economy. Before I turn it back to her, I do wanna let the audience know that we have an opportunity for students interested in learning more about the ideas found in Karen's book and mainline political economy more broadly. The Don Lavoie Fellowship is currently accepting applications. This is an online fellowship program for undergraduate, early career graduate students, and anyone considering graduate school but has not yet enrolled. Students from around the world are welcome to apply and can come from any major or background, not just economics. The deadline for this fellowship is April 15th, and the application can be found on our website. I will also try to post a link in the chat box below, um, but thank you. Thank you, Jessica. If I would be younger, I would probably apply for the fellowship, <laughs> younger and undergraduate. Uh, please leave your contacts and all the relevant links in the chat box so our public can uh, take note. Uh, the book instead can be purchased uh, uh, on Amazon and the traditional online channels. Um, so now, um, without further ado, I want to give the stage to Professor Vo for her presentation. Thank you very much. Well, am I, am I on now? Yes. Oh, okay. Please. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I was asked to speak about some of the ideas in my, the book that has just been published. And I want to start by telling you a little bit about my background. I was trained as a conventional uh, micro theorist and mostly a historian of economic thought. And I thought all questions were answered, especially by partial equilibrium theory. I thought that the fact that prices bring about balance between supply and demand and that there was coordination in <clears throat> through prices that also I, I thought it was just such a revelation that businesses would wind up because of, of perfect competition uh, <clears throat> uh, producing where marginal cost equals marginal revenue and minimum long run average cost. And I thought, well, I have learned how the world works. I was, in, I was made acquainted with Austrian economics and, and as an undergraduate, but I didn't pay much attention to it. It really wasn't until 1974 when I was invited to a conference on Austrian economics that has since been uh, been identified as the beginning of the Austrian revival. Now, why revival? Well, because up until this time, it, Austrian economics was very much a little fringe, uh, a set of ideas that was not paid much attention to by the uh, rest of the economics profession. It was sort of kept alive by Murray Rothbard and Israel Kirzner. Um, <clears throat> so, and I went to this conference and there were lectures by Rothbard, Kirzner, and Ludwig Lachmann. Now, I have to say, I understand there's quite an interest in Ludwig Lachmann here, but I didn't understand a word he was saying at that conference um, because it was all so new to me. But Kirzner was very impressive. He talked about his theory of entrepreneurship, and he talked, but <clears throat> he talked about the coordinating. Uh, the coordinating function of entrepreneurs, but it seemed to me that was in pretty much within the context of a conventional um, micro theory explanation of markets. Now, Lachman was kind of intriguing, but as I said, I didn't really understand what he was saying. He talked about markets as processes. And of course that made sense because I thought you could use Marshallian economics to describe processes, but ongoing processes. And he, he had, he's, and he, the importance of subjectivity where subject, where economics was subjective, not only subjective preferences, but subjective um, expectations and subjectivity of knowledge itself. And at the time that didn't 
really resonate. I didn't really understand what he was saying. So even though I really was intrigued by many of the things the Austrians said, said at this conference, I was <clears throat> kind of thinking, well, maybe I should look into this a little bit more, but not really convinced. What started me on my road to becoming an Austrian ec economist was the fact that I had occasion to study the economic calculation debate soon after I was in South Royalton. Now, some of you may not know about this debate. I mean, it happened um, 90 years ago, 80 to 90 years ago, it was in the 1930s. But this was a time when even conventional economists had a certain affection for the idea of socialist economies. I mean, after all, this was during the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, it seemed like markets were failing, uh, capitalism wasn't working. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, and there was also a great interest on the Soviet Union and the fact that they were now a socialist economy. However, there was a theoretical debate that actually was begun by Ludwig von Mises in 1920, where he said, look, the trouble with socialism where the means of production um, are owned by the state and if private property rights have been abolished, it will be impossible, and, with, and also with no money um, calculation, would be impossible to know what is uh, the right price and what is an efficient outcome. Now, this, was, this challenge was taken up by neoclassical economists, and, it was, and there were two kinds of arguments that began to convince me that there was something wrong <clears throat> with the neoclassical paradigm. Uh, one kind of argument started from general equilibrium. And, it's, and the, the idea of the argument was that, well, we see there are these equations which that un, are, are um, showing, uh, showing perfect equilibrium among all markets. We know that these markets are characterized by supply and demand curves. All we have to do is gather statistics to then uh, develop a, a general equilibrium model and then calculate the prices and tell producers to charge those prices. Now, of course, this was 19, 19, 1935 or six, and at that time there was no computers. So this was dismissed as impractical. But the one that really seemed to catch everybody's um, uh, <clears throat> attention was by Oscar Lange, where he said, look, all we have to do is mimic what the market does, but have a planning board do the, make the decisions so that producers could operate in firms. They, they, firms would be owned by the state, but if they have to develop, uh, have to determine market prices, what they could do is the planning board could announce a price and then have uh, that price be effective in the market and then see if there were surpluses and shortages. If there are surpluses, well, then you raise the price, I mean, but lower the price if there are surpluses, shortages, you raise the price. And then this would take care of it. And then you tell firms to set to operate where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And for some reason, this was considered to be a really uh, perceptive and possible means of running a socialist economy. Well, in my course of my, my uh, study of this, I read of, um, most of Hayek's papers where he uh, challenged this and he started to identify things he said, it was almost like he couldn't believe anybody would say this <laughs> because he started off to say, look, we don't even know what a product is. You, can't, you will have an aggregate of products in these firms, um, but you don't. <clears throat> and as far as setting prices, it misunderstands totally the process of price formation in a market economy. And it assumes that information or knowledge is equally given and available. Well, he had many, many more um, 
uh, particularized uh, criticisms, but those were the ones I started thinking about. And it was shortly after that, that I started to get more and more interested in Austrian economics, because it was pretty clear if, if neoclassical economics could think this was a good way to organize an economy, um, I, it was clearly missing something. Now, <clears throat> from this, I went to read what I think were the, the pivotal articles that really started me trying to identify what the problems were. And these were Hayek's knowledge articles. Now, most of you may know some of these articles because they're, they are fundamental to um, how Austrians think about the world. There were three that I wanna mention. The first two I thought, well, his, the, that I thought were still compatible with neoclassical economics. The use of knowledge in society was an article where Hayek showed how prices were necessary to convey information that was dispersed among many different participants in the market process. The information wasn't there. It was that was could be aggregated, it was dispersed and prices were necessary to communicate this information. And I remember at the time thinking, well, yeah, that's pretty much you know, the way we teach micro theory to undergraduates. We give, we tell a story about how these um, prices are arrived at. Uh, so it didn't seem to be a crucial difference between Austrian economics and neoclassical economics. Now, the other one that I thought was more or less in keeping with how I understood the world through a neoclassical uh, lens was the meaning of competition. And that was really about competition as rivalry, that competition is not automatic. It's, it's firms competing with each other, not only through prices, but through uh, but through the nature of the product, how it's offered, selling, how they sell the product. And, and I thought, well, that, again, a useful distinction, but maybe not a crucial, a crucial difference. The third article was the one that really, really confused me. It was economics and knowledge. And he started questioning, wait a minute, here we have this notion of equilibrium where, ev where everything is, uh, where all problems are worked out and all knowledge is, is, is shared, that consumers get, you know, maximize, can maximize their, their utility subject to budget constraints, firms can maximize profits uh, subject to technological limitations and cost. And he said, but what do we mean by equilibrium? Uh, for an individual, he said, equilibrium makes some sense because what you're for an individual, you can you can pursue a plan and achieve it, and for that time you're in, in uh, equilibrium. But the, the economy is just not an individual; it's a it's in a group of individuals. It's a whole nation of individuals, and each individual has his own plans and, and somehow these plans have to be coordinated. Now, prices have a role to play in changing responses to knowledge, but the market never really settles down to a general equilibrium. It's an ongoing process. And, and this is something Lachman had said at South Royalton, um, but that Hayek <clears throat> perhaps, no, perhaps for his, the influence of Hayek on Lachman there is, is evident. But if it never settles down to an equilibrium, then what is equilibrium really useful? Now, remember, equilibrium is a metaphor. It, it's not a thing. It's a way of understanding what we see in the, the, the apparent order that's out there in an economic system. But it's a, it's a metaphor that's borrowed from physics it's, and mathematics. And maybe that's not the appropriate metaphor to understand the coordination of, of actions in a market economy. Now, this subject was hotly debated among Austrian circles 
in the late 70s and, early, and the, into the 80s. And it was fueled by a, a debate between Lachman and Kersner. I'm just looking at my time to see how I'm doing. <clears throat> um, now, Kersner invited Lachman to attend NYU in a, a once a, um, for the spring semester for a number of years. And one of the issues that they were in, in agreement about so many aspects, one of the issues that they were not in agreement about was the very use of the equilibrium. Kersner, I think, was trying to show the, the, relate, the links to neoclassical economics and was trying to show neoclassical economics that you needed something besides just automatic maximizing behavior. You needed the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur's role was to notice price discrepancies and then through an basically arbitrage, close them and thereby bring the, the economic system into closer coordination. Uh, that it was in a way an, 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 <clears throat> an outreach to conventional economics. And he's providing a process by which uh, non-determined human action could bring about uh, uh, price coordination. Now, Lachman, on the hand, other hand, was critical of this, but in sort of an unsystematic way. Um, he emphasized the radical uncertainty of all plans. Yes, of course, we can, we can plan to achieve our purposes, but what guarantee do we have that will actually allow us to achieve these purposes. The world is uncertain. Circumstances change. And if circumstances change, then your plan may fail. You may have to alter it. Uh, that <clears throat> this, there's this constant, almost roiling of the system that somehow is observable as, as, <clears throat> as a, a coordinated whole but it's not perfectly coordinated the way general equilibrium theory would suggest. In fact, it's ongoing and constantly changing. There are patterns, but no predictability. And I like the metaphor he used then, he called it a kaleidic society. You know, you know what a kaleidoscope is. You, it's a tube with crystals and you turn them and you get different patterns all the time. And, and the idea, was that there's always a pattern, but it's always changing and you can't predict it. Now, but then how, how can, <clears throat> excuse me, then how is order possible? Well, especially uh, um, his, his, in light of his insistence that the future is unpredictable, but Lachlan said, well, it's not, the future is unknowable, but it's not unimaginable. And of course, this was a very puzzling thing. You know, if, it's not, if it's knowable, but not unimaginable, how can we imagine it? What is it about the market economy that allows us to imagine a world where we can um, we, we can we can achieve our plans, and more to the point, how is it that most of the time we can? There are large sections of our life where it, they, achieving our our plans are sort of, are uncontroversial. So how is this possible? And that led, I think, to a search for another metaphor for understanding economic. Um, economic order. Now, I want to point out there was no controversy about the fact that there is an order out there. It's this obvious empirical fact that if you want to, if you want to purchase something, there's a store out there. If you want to exchange with somebody, it's possible to do it. And that the world, you can pretty much chug along day by day without worrying about about some chaos that's going to present you, you would be presented with. So where then could we, 
look to understand in a systematic way this this world out there where it's obviously true we we don't we can't predict the future we don't know everything we can trade with one another but how do we know we're not going to wind up as you know with with big areas of of incompatibility and chaos now there's where i turn to hayek now we know in hayek's knowledge articles knowledge is fragmented it's situational it's techniques of production and exchange and another thing it's often tacit now what do we mean by tacit well it means that there are things we know that perhaps we can't articulate very easily well, hayek was thinking about skills and skills are used in the market um, by people who maybe have a skill for just finding out new things, but a capacity for discovering new circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Market action takes place in time, and the passage of time implies some level of learning. This was another point Lachman made that just the very passage of time implies. You've learned something. If nothing more, if nothing more than just what happened in the past gives you better, gives you some uh, confidence that maybe you can predict little parts of the future. Now, Kayak argued that really what we should not be talking about is an economy. We should be talking about, and he, co he coined this term, a catalaxy. Now, as an historian of economic thought, I was very um, um, attuned to this distinction because it comes from Aristotle. Aristotle in the politics talked about economia, which was the art of household management, which was exactly uh, Hayek's point that within a household, there is a decision maker who then decides to allocate resources and to, you know, to um, basically control the budget. And it's the aims of the householder, the single decision maker, that then becomes the economizer. But then Aristotle said in exchange in, in many individuals, he called, he said, he called it cataloxis, I think, which was uh, the art of exchange. Now, Aristotle was not a great fan of the free market, but on the other hand, he did make the distinction between the art of exchange in markets and economics, which was household management. So, uh, <clears throat> so Hayek then start, said we, we should be talking about a theory of exchange among multiple individuals. But how does it work? What makes it coordinated? Now, of course, we know about the price system, but there, as Hayek points out, there are also recognizable patterns that emerge in the market. And these recognizable patterns are really the kind of the basis of the market order. Now, Hayek, focus specifically on the rules of property and contract, the framework, the legal framework, where in the legal framework, as long as people follow the rules um, and then exchange peaceably, you would, have, um, you would have a coordinated system. Uh, <clears throat> now the rule, there are all, but he also pointed out there are informal rules. Those are rules of exchange. Now I've learned this, that there are certain customs that have to be followed. I learned that much to my uh, dismay in foreign travel, when sometimes I try to buy something in a supermarket and find out I didn't weigh my products where I should have because their customs were different. Or one time I remember being in Greece and trying to buy fruit from a push cart and I tried to pick my own fruit and the seller was incensed and took it back. And I tried to pick it and he took it back and wouldn't sell it to me because the custom there was that the seller picks the fruit for you. So when I read about these importance of customs and trade, I thought I could find many instances where that was um, 
where, where I had experienced that myself. So price is an important means of, of sharing knowledge, but for prices to do their job, there has to be some expectation that your plans are capable of being realized. And that means you need this basis of market stability. Well, what is it? And here we go back to Lachlan, because Lachlan in all of his kind of free form you know, discussions and would talk about institutions as points of orientation. Again, when I first heard this, I had no idea what he was talking about, points of orientation. Um, but then the more I thought of it, the institutional fabric is really a very, very important part of a coordinated market process. <clears throat> they are in a way the facilitators of market order. Think of things like retail establishments, firms, manufacturers, uh, salespeople. Those are all kinds of institutions in a, that emerge in a market order and <clears throat> allow people to have great areas of, of predictability in their lives. I used to tell my students, what's remarkable about our economy is if you go to the store to buy bread, you don't you take it for granted. But if you go to buy bread and it's not there, you're you're enraged, you know, because you expect certain things to be uh, to be available without even worrying about it. You expect the institution of the market, the supermarket, to be there. Uh, so, and th this allows this large basis of predictability, and it then can the market can then be explained as an interconnected web of institutions that are linked by the price system. The, in the more advanced economy, the more, it, the more complex the institutional matrix. Now, the nice thing about this, it's, it isn't static, it changes, but, um, but not everything changes at once. And the, the, one of the problems with general equilibrium theory, one thing changes and everything else seems to uh, be required to change uh, to, and to bring about the new equilibrium. And in this case, the, the institutions are ongoing, uh, ongoing locuses of market activity. And what and the prices can, people can change within that structure um, how they want to, how they how they want to uh, pursue their projects and plans. <clears throat> so the other facet of this way of looking at the catalaxy as is that um, it's ongoing. It, uh, there's growth. There's increasing wealth. Now, what? How is this possible? Well, because new institution, uh, institutions grow through people finding better ways of doing things. And if you think about where we, we think of technology as growing and those new ways of doing things, but also the ways in which people trade change and they, they become more e efficient over time. Uh, so in a way, this increasing wealth, or as Deirdre McCloskey would have called it, the great enrichment, is a consequence of institutional change that's brought about by new ways of marketing goods, new product niches to exploit. And these are really, really solutions to problems that were perceived before. Gee, how can I improve my sales? Oh, well, let me try this. Oh, it works. Okay, then that becomes codified as, a, as an institution. Uh, so rather than a physics metaphor, an equilibrium, or metaphor of the kaleidoscope, I think we can think of the, um, of the catalaxy more akin to a biological metaphor where um, species evolve more, and, <clears throat> 
course, with, with you have to be careful about that because there are many differences. Um, probably more appropriate is to think of a market as a complex adaptive system where many agents interact with one another, pursuing their own advantage. And we know there's no hierarchy of ends. There is no globally available knowledge. People are always groping in the, with their own environment. Um, but, and of course, one person's actions affect other people's ability, it changes other people's knowledge. And this can lead to not only satisfaction of wants, but to the growth of new institutions and new ways of doing things that then enrich the society. And I wanna point out here that this is, why would, why would we care about this? Well, because if you think of the neoclassical model of general equilibrium, it's used to identify nothing but market failures, as far as I can tell. You know, this is the way the perfect market and the real market fall short, and therefore uh, we need to correct that those market failures. But if you think of the market as a Cadillac, as a complex system that emerges from the bottom up, then how do you even identify a market failure? A market failure is really just after the fact, somebody saying, gee, we could have done that better, you know, and we could have done that differently. Uh, but it's not a failure ex ante. They're only something that, um, and perhaps a mistake that you discover ex post. Um, and while it's not perfect, as, as I think Mises said, a market is as perfect as it can be. And especially when you think, and this is the question that all economists need to ask themselves, as compared to what? And when we think of a market economy, a catalaxy where people, where people don't have to ask permission to build and change, uh, as opposed to uh, one where they have to get permission before they can engage in any novel activity, um, you can always, it, the, the uh, comparison, which it, 20 years ago might have seemed obvious to people, is that markets win hands down all the time. So we, so we can, so what does bound the market? Formally, as Hayek said, the formal rules of property and contract, and that's what so much constitutional economics was about setting up the rules of, of property and contract uh, to, to um, get it right. And then the informal rules of institutional uh, formation and change. And the empirical observation is that wealth grows and becomes more widely distributed in market economies that are operating within well-designed laws than under, under any other known institutional structure. And here you need to read Deirdre McCloskey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the enlightening presentation. I really enjoy, and I'm sure that our public enjoyed too. So now I invite the attendees to write their questions, if any, in the Q&A box, uh, so we can uh, take chance of having Professor Bohm with us um, for answering every, any question and doubt that you have. Um, and I would like to start this uh, question and answer session uh, asking to you a reflection on the current status of uh, Austrian economics under uh, this perspective. Um, somehow I have always been obsessed with uh, South Royalton that you mm -hmm. mentioned for the fact that I was not there. I mean, I was not born. Uh, so, but um, when I started to get uh, um, into Austrian economics when I was a student, thanks to one of my professors, um, I was very intrigued by what happened there. And I figured out that being there and working with that group of people in the years immediately after that, 
there was also the period in which Hayek won the Nobel Prize, must have been a super thrilling uh, moment uh, I have in mind also, but also a, a moment of self-reflection. And I have in mind the books published by Lauren Moss, so New Direction in Austrian Economics. So there, there were these uh, three lines of, of thought emerging, Rothbard, Hildner, and Lachman. So, and probably nowadays we see also uh, the differentiation of the line of thought. We have the, the Mises Institute on one side, and we have the work of uh, uh, George Mason University uh, on the other side. And uh, it, it seems to me that probably uh, the moment of maturity of the reflection that started with the South Royalton Conference was probably the publishing of Economics of Time and Ignorance. Uh, mm -hmm. Mario Rizzo and Gerald Odrisco in 1985 it was the book that convinced me that I had to become an Austrian economist when I read it and it was it was probably 2024 and uh, deeply influenced me. Um, where do we stand today compared with that period? I mean probably I'm in this part of the world I'm in Malaysia where this this kind of ideological debate probably is less felt than the West but uh, I have the impression that some of the spark of the flame of that period is uh, is exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we are probably in a different <laughs> stage compared to that. Um, so so where do we stand now? Do we need another South Royalton conference, probably in Asia, uh, which is <laughs> uh, the, the continent uh, of, of the future of this century? And which are the research uh, topic, or what, what, how does it look like a research agenda for an ocean economist in the 21st century? In the 21st century, if any uh, proper ocean agenda still makes sense. Hmm. That's a very complicated question, <laughs> and even though. I suspected you were going to ask that. It's hard to come up with it. So let me let me start by describing the situation in 1974. There were basically in the United States two figures, prominent figures, who represented Austrian economics, and that was Israel Kirzner and Murray Rothbard. Now, Murray Rothbard was a vigorous uh, defender of Ludwig von Mises. He hardly ever mentioned Hayek, didn't, I don't think he, he liked him very much. Um, but the two of them had published works that got, got professional recognition. And um, there were other pockets around of people teaching, but who weren't really publishing. But, and I think Rothbard especially, because he was a very charismatic figure, he, he identified young people who I must say were attracted first by the libertarian message, but then they would started to study the, the economic texts. And so South Royalton was a kind of, it, it, it had two purposes. One was to gather any person who had expressed any interest in Austrian economics to come and, and to, you know, listen to the lectures where the three people setting out crucial aspects of the Austrian approach and also sort of an outreach to fellow travelers, property rights theorists, you know, people who, um, uh, well, actually that's some, uh, people interested in information theory. Um, what, and as neophytes like me expressed an interest and there was a feeling of of kind of revolutionary feeling in there. We, you know, the, the idea was that we were going to change the world because we were going to show good economics and how, how it was different. Um, well, for some of them anyway. And, uh, and it's, but what I, I think is the crucial thing is it identified a community. And that was, you, you don't do research by yourself. It has to be, in, you, you talk to your colleagues, you think about things. I almost can't write unless I talk to somebody first because I have to, you know, get, think. Um, 
And as you may tell, I haven't given a lecture for a long time because I haven't had the opportunity. But uh, um, it seems that that getting that forming these connections among, among, um, among young economists who sort of knew each other, other but didn't have formal communication, I think was the catalyst. Um, Institute for Humanity Studies was very important in that. Uh, so anyway, and then there were a series of conferences built up this enthusiasm. We have a new way of thinking about the world. Uh, the split didn't come until later because a lot of us discovered Hayek. And we thought, and like I personally, when I wrote my calculation article, I thought I was, I was critiquing Rothbard's article and I thought he gave all the, the uh, credit to Mises, and I thought Hayek did an enormous amount in clarifying and adding new ideas. Well, George Mason became sort of, I mean, with great allegiance to Mises, but still looking at trying to push the paradigm forward, looking at things Hayek said, and then of course, Lachman became important. And Rothbard hated Lachman. You know, he just, he hated what he said. He didn't, even much like Kersner, but I mean, that's that's a different issue. Uh, and Hayek, he thought was a term coat because he agreed that maybe there was a, a room for some welfare, you know, in a, in a modern state. So, and the Mises Institute formed and that that breach was, was impossible. There was no way to, to try to bring that together as long as Rothbard was alive. Uh, so that, but then you got this real energy, we have something new. Now, I'm not the best person to ask about the state of Austrian economics today because I've been retired for quite a number of years. And frankly, I only read what I want to read now. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I go, to, I go to the SDA meetings and I don't see that same enthusiasm. And I'm not sure why, you know, and Pete, Pete Betke could probably talk to you a lot more about this, but the, the real, the fact is that, let's say you go to one of the programs where you learn Austrian economics, you have to, and you wanna make a living. We always have that problem. You have to publish. And, and uh, so you, you, have to, you have to find topics that will be, um, well, I should take that back because there are more Austrian outlets to publish it now. But still, I think what happens is you take, there, there are more kind of empirical articles, part, um, articles more about uh, critiquing some government misguided program, which I think is very valuable work and I encourage it to keep, you know, keep going on. But I don't know about another self Royalton. I'm not sure what would be the focus, you know? You had to have, you have to have some, are, are you, are you, are we still excited about maybe a new paradigm? When I, in the concluding part of the introduction of my book, I said, it looks like these, these issues are not discussed anymore in this, you know, debate may be old hat, but it was what energized me. And I think to have that would need to find out what would energize the new, the new generation. Also, we're much bigger. I mean, do you know how many people show up at the SDA meetings now? I mean, we started off with, with uh, I think 60 people came to the first one. And now there are a couple, you know, well over a hundred, there are you know, several hundred sometimes papers, concurrent sessions, you know. So it's, it's a much more dispersed, group. So how would you go about doing that? I'm, my entrepreneurial skills don't, don't uh, stretch to figuring that one out, especially now in my retired state. Um, but I think that's what you'd have to do is figure out what would energize the group to make, is it just, uh, is, it, is it just identifying really bad economic policies, again, which I think is very important, or is there a theoretical core 
that we still want to push? And that's a question I ask if there are Austrians out there in the audience and, you know, Pete actually ever watches this, that uh, I would like to know because it's something I've been asking myself. I was away for seven years. I retired and I went to, I, you know, I pursued my singing career. And then seven years later, I decided to go back and start listening to papers. And one of the things I found is there's a lot of interesting you know, in the uh, HIAC program, lots of interesting papers and philosophy and, and, and um, uh, po po the political economy and all, but it was more, it was more, it was less focused. I guess that's what I want to say. Long uh, answer to your question, sorry. No, no, I, I, I'm myself in search of this identity and I have a conversation with uh, younger people on these and I found myself trapped in a uh, in a middle land because I am too young to, to have been part of that movement of South, mm -hmm. South Royalton, but intellectually I'm very much anchored to that kind of revival. So that are the topics that mm -hmm. awaken interest in me. So that methodology, the new paradigm, uh, mm -hmm. I work a lot on hermeneutics and capital theory, business cycles, um, uh, I, I have a strong influence uh, from Schumpeter as well, um, but I don't find that interest any longer in the people that are younger than me, um, in the profession. And probably one point that I see is also that universities are less uh, that uh, cultural uh, place that we used to be. So they look to me, at least in this part of the world, much closer to, to high school than uh, to a place for uh, intellectual, oh, wow. an intellectual mm -hmm. debate. So you don't find that kind of conversation within the traditional academic environment. And probably you have to look for it uh, outside. You know, I, I want to add one thing to what I said before, because I said, you know, what could energize people? <clears throat> uh, I wrote, I guess my last Hayek article, my last economics article was, Hayek's theory of the market order as a complex adaptive system. And believe me, I am not qualified to talk deeply about this, but just reading the characteristics of a complex adaptive system made me think that's what an economy is. It's, it's, it emerges from, the, from choices from, of individuals who then, kind of, then um, create these market institutions I was talking about, regular, regular activities. And there is the, it, there's a math, there's a, 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 not only a mathematics, but a com, but uh, computer research that start, that, that can stimulate very, very simple markets. I have uh, two friends and colleagues, Roger Koppel mm -hmm. and, Oh gosh, this is recorded too, and I can't think of her last name, Abigail. <laughs> she was a George Mason student, really mm -hmm. brilliant student. Abby, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, they are working in complex systems, but it never caught on, you know, and, and I think I think playing on that, that of course, the, the people who are doing work in complex adaptive systems at the at the Santa Fe Institute were sort of taking the old view, okay now. Let's see what happens in markets and why they're bad. You know, <laughs> always looking for mistakes rather than thinking about how marvelous, how marvelous that this really is. That might possibly have been a, a source of, of enthusiasm, but it doesn't seem to have panned out. Uh, Roger Cope, by the way, was the first, well, one of the first guests of this uh, series of webinar. Uh, Did he talk about that? He talked about expert failure, his, uh, his book oh, okay. on expert failure, yeah, we talked about that. Um, okay, we have some questions in, in the box. Um, I would start with this from Samruda Surana. Uh, brilliant talk. Have Austrian economists today reached a consensus on either Kirzner or Lachmann's ideas of equilibrium? In your opinion, is there value in looking at entrepreneurial activity as leading to an equilibrium? 
Well, once again, I can, as, as an explanatory device, when I taught micro theory to undergraduates, of course, I started off believing the whole thing. But then as I stopped believing it, I still found value in using the pictures, you know, the, the supply and demand curves. Um, not because I thought they were perfectly descriptive of the world, but it allowed me to talk about how this might come about. So it was a, it was a you know, a, a way of, um, of use of describing a process by which some coordination could take place. And I think just about all Austrian economists will do that because, but note it's a picture. I never found putting the mathematical equations on the board to be of any help whatsoever. You, you, want, you want some visual to, and then you can talk about, well, some, you know, the price goes up and producers notice that their demand for their product is getting greater and they really, you know, you can, you can tell a story. Um, but I don't think there's much beyond that that's, that's worth considering. Um, and Kersner really used them that way to tell the story about how the entrepreneur brings about coordination. And he made very effective use. I mean, he kept uh, talking, you know, putting more qualifications on it. But it, it, it's, it's, for one thing, I think it's the closest thing neoclassical comes to pretty much an accurate description. Um, now, all of the stuff about production functions and, you know, it's useless, throw it away. <laughs> and I quit teaching micro when I realized I really couldn't be honest and, and teach that stuff. It assumes so much knowledge that, you know, is, is not available. So on the one hand, yeah, there are some aspects that help you to explain things from an Austrian perspective. But as far as the kersner lockman debate, I think Kersner went a little too far. Um, and he was worried and that if you jettison the notion of equilibrium, you have nothing to put in its place and you have no explanation for the coherence of a market economy. He one time said, if you don't have equilibrium, you have chaos. And frankly, the way, you know, Lachlan would talk, it sounded kind of chaotic. <laughs> um, but I think what, what emerged was, if you know, it's not chaos. Basically, it's a different way of understanding the world where it's not an equilibrium. It's, it's an order. It's, it's an evolving order. It, it's a... Uh, a catalactic order, but you know, how do you talk about that to a, a bigger profession? <laughs> you know? But as far as Austrians are going, uh, are concerned, I think pretty much they'll stick with some of the um, Marshallian uh, market economy, but then put that in the context of a more open-ended ongoing process. I hope that answers the question. Uh. So it's not completely resolved. <laughs> yep. Thank you. We have here another interesting question from Joshua Ammons. Will you say more about the differences between the peculiarities of regional markets and customs or the institutional details and universality of economic inquiry? How should social scientists think about when to use the economic tools suited for particularity and when to use tools of universality. What are the best tools for each situation? Can I ask for a clarification? Tools of universality. Can you, can you explain more what you mean by that? So we give time to Joshua Ammons to further clarify and still in uh, type here in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, meanwhile, I will uh, make the, the, another question from Samruda Surana. Uh, I'm a little puzzled at your description of being able to buy something you want to buy at the supermarket as an institution. The idea of institutions that I have is that of them being rules of the game. Can any no. repetitive, predictable activity or order be understood as an institution? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that last part. 
I was can any repetitive, predictable activity or order be understood as an institution? Yeah, and maybe institution isn't the best word. It's just the word that Lachman used. And um, but regular recurring patterns of action. That's what I'm thinking. Now, it, it, I, the question has caused me to start to think that we need a, a better word for, the, for this because we think of institutions as buildings, you know, as, um, <clears throat> but, and that seems so very different from being able, well, the supermarket is the institution. It's, you know, that's what's the institution because it's a regular, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a predictable aspect of market exchange. Uh, firms, the way firms are organized are institutions in the sense that they have, um, they are predictable means of, excuse me, they're predictable in the sense that there are regular patterns of action. With actually Nelson and Winter a long time ago has had a theory of um, institutional theory of the firm, where firms are characterized not only by formal rules, but by informal rules within each department. It's the rules. If you want to think of the, the persistence of the rule as another way of thinking about an institution. Uh, but what are the things that are more or less permanent? One time Hayek said, the market works uh, to, to deal with change as long as not everything changes at once. Well, what doesn't change at once? It's these regular patterns within firms and within retail establishments, uh, within, well, even in, a, in um, farmer's markets. You know, there are things you do and things you do. The, the market is there. That's part of the what you can rely on. And I think while the word may be maybe too encompassing of what we mean, um, it's these, these regular recurring patterns that build on each other so that we don't have a barter economy. We have a money economy and what is, and we have not, you could think of a primitive one where there are buyers and sellers, but then they form the, the, the sellers maybe uh, have kiosks or then they have, then they have uh, um, permanent structures. They, they build on each other. Uh, even think of technologies that, that build on each other because a regular way of doing things, somebody says, gee, we can do it better this way. And then the technology changes. And I think, you know, that's what we need more work to do on because it's, that is clearly one of the crucial elements in why some economies are rich and why some of them they're poor. It's the good legal structure that then hampers the ability of these informal institutions to emerge. I hope, I hope that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here there is another question. I can't pronounce the name, I guess it's Japanese. Um, the so-called calculation debate transformed some economists into Austrian economists, mm -hmm. like, like it was your case. Well, but there have been still many economists who continue to adhere to conventional neoclassical economics. How do you think uh, and why this difference happened? Uh, is it anything? Is that uh, it is? Uh, is it anything to do with the thought about how institutions matter for the market coordination? If it is, can we say that what differentiates Austrian economics from neoclassical one? is how we think the importance of institutions, seriously? Very involved question here. Well, for the first, the quest, first part. Uh, <clears throat> you, as I said somewhere in my book, it takes a theory to beat a theory. And what Hayek did was criticize the use of neoclassical theory 
for in in, in um, building a new institutional structure, taking away all of the uh, familiar means of doing business. The government would own all the means of production and dictate on the basis of their belief that they had enough information uh, to make economic choices. Now, Hayek's work on, <clears throat> on specifically on the economic calculation debate was to point out all the limitations. Well, for one thing, how do you divide a product? Um, if, you are, if you're a government, you need statistical aggregates. You can't, know, you can't identify the myriad products that are on the market. Products are often not just physical things, but availability and you know, regularity of, of, uh, of delivery. And, and he pointed out things like, um, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, let me, excuse me, just a second. Well, basically his point was you had to, you can't change the total market institutional structure and expect to replicate what happens in a, in a, in, in a, in a free market. So he was critical. And most economists could buy into a lot of his critic criticisms. As I said, when I read it, I thought, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. It didn't immediately turn me into an Austrian economist. It was following that up with the knowledge articles. And there, the one that really, um, uh, the first two, a neoclassical economist could say, oh yeah, that's right. But the third one, economics and knowledge, that was the one that set up I think the whole questioning of the paradigm itself within the Austrian structure, Austrian community. So I guess the debate itself was not sufficient to change a, a typical neoclassical economist. Um, it, and when you consider that uh, one, of the, one of the arguments was, well, we could do this if we had computers that were big enough and strong enough. And to, to the end of his days, Lange was thinking, well, if we could just get the right computer um, uh, capacity. Although Lange himself thought, well, maybe the institutionals. Oh, this is another thing. This was very important. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, neoclassical socialists assumed that individuals would act the same way whether whether or not they had discretion or whether they were following orders. And this was something that Hayek pointed out and that was dismissed as you know, not really an economic question. So the first part of the question, I can see how it wouldn't automatically turn people into Austrians. The, the, it would turn people and into Austrians, and I'm not sure, maybe I have an idiosyncratic biography here, but I would think it's that combined with a reading of Mises and Hayek's various articles, um, <clears throat> and the Kersner, Rothbard, it, it didn't happen overnight that I became an Austrian economist. And if you didn't pursue and follow up and read all these other things, uh, it, you wouldn't, I don't think you would be even mildly driven to question the basic paradigm. Um, I think it's also <clears throat> true that a lot of economists were trying to incorporate some of these ideas into conventional economics. There was information economics, right? the economics of information, for, for example, uh, came in. <clears throat> and there, there was a, actually there was a flowering during the 70s and 80s of some really interesting work on firms, on um, and, and, um, property rights theory, then constitutional economics. It was a great time to be an Austrian economist. Now, I don't know, that, well, as, as I said earlier, in answer to your question, now it's kind of a whole different environment. I'm not sure I answered all parts of this question, but. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to, to 
to close with uh, with a last question um, on uh, on Lachman, uh, your a little bit of your personal remembering of him uh, as a man, as an economist, uh, and uh, a judgment uh, also on uh, the the actual influence of Lachman on the Austrian research agenda. In a paper in 2017, Virgil Storr wrote, uh, we are all Lachmanian now, uh, <laughs> which is uh, an interesting perspective. I'm not sure if uh, everybody within the Austrian environment would agree <laughs> with that, <laughs> uh, in particular because it seems to me that the dichotomy that we have uh, analyzed before, it became even, uh, even deeper now. I mean, I think that the two words are words that are non-communicating, non uh, we don't communicate anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So we may say that probably Lachman influenced only one part, so the George Mason group has an influence from Lachman. And it is really, um, there is a space to bring ahead uh, the Lachman research project or is it just a waste of time? <laughs> Well, I think when Virgil said that, remember Virgil was a student of Don Lavoy, and Don Lavoy was a huge fan of Lachman. He brought Lachman basically to George Mason University, at, you know, as as someone we should study. We invited Lachman to come to George Mason. Um, I don't. I, I guess you you. You say you're younger than I am, so you probably never met him or saw him, but he had a very unusual way of speaking. And when, when you listen to him speak, it was hard to pay attention to what he said because of this very unusual way of presenting his arguments, you know, <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he was a delightful person, really. So, but he you would say enough, he would say enough to make you go and read something that he wrote. Uh, he, he had tremendous influence on, on Lavoie's way of thinking and my way of thinking as a consequence because he did challenge, he did challenge the contemporary paradigm. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we're all Lachmanians now. I think, uh, uh, Virgil Store, Emily Chamley Wright, they are working on bringing cultural considerations into economic theory. And this is very, I hate to get into this because I don't want to really want to talk about it, but a hermeneutical approach to understanding the world. Um, I remember when Lavoie first told me, started telling me about hermeneutics and how it was a, basically a way of, you, it starts with reading, you know, it, it's based on reading a text, but you have to read the text of the whole environment. And this is very Lachmanian. And that, that in really excited, well, David Prochitko, who may, may or may not be listening, uh, has worked on, on that aspect of economics. Um, but, my senses, like when I go to the, the SDAE meetings, there really aren't very many people who are still talking about him. Um, I think that's kind of a shame, but again, not being systematic is a real handicap, you know, in, in professional discourse. I think he had some of the most, for me, enlightening insights. Like one thing, uh, capital theory. I know this sounds pretty obvious now, but when I first was reading his, 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 some of this capital theory, capital was the accumulation of artifacts basically that helped you to create wealth. And, and this was very important in my understanding of the market process. Just because a business fails doesn't mean that their capital stock goes away and it can be repurposed and so that's, the, you know, you don't lose anything. And that actually helped me understand how to think about institutional development. Um, he, uh, his, his, 
his talk about the unending market process, I think everybody agrees with that now, but they don't necessarily identify it as Lachmanian. I think it would actually, that would be a very valuable thing for people, you know, younger people who, who weren't exposed to this to start with. I suspect they still read him at George Mason, as they say, I've been retired for years, but I'm sure there, you know, he's given uh, some attention, but, um, no, we're not all Lachmanians now. <laughs> I hope I will have uh, more time to work on that. Uh, just to mention, the previous question was from Professor Hiroyuki Okon from Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. Now he, he identified himself and Professor Okon has worked on, uh, on a Japanese economist that had a similar approach and then the Mises one to the social, to the social, uh, cal socialist economy calculation debate. And we have discussed this when we met uh, in 2010 in Tokyo uh, mm -hmm. for dinner. I still remember this episode. So thanks, Professor Ocon, for having joined uh, this, uh, uh, this webinar. Um, I would call back on stage uh, Jessica for a final salutation. And then uh, we, we will close. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining. This was a really, really fascinating conversation, and I learned a bunch from both Karen and um, Carmelo. And if anyone has students who are interested in Mercatus Fellowship programs, there is a link in the bio, and you can also reach out directly to me um, at my email address, which I also um, put a link in the, the chat below. Um, but again, thank you both for joining. This was a, a really, really fascinating conversation. Thanks, Jessica. Well, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I also put uh, our uh, social media um, links in uh, in the chat box, so you can follow uh, future publications. And uh, I invite you in particular to download uh, the educational series of paper that we are publishing. We are very active in uh, in the policy conversation in Malaysia, so we have policy papers, we have policy brief. Uh, which are very much downloaded, but I'm more proud of our educational line uh, that we use for courses and classes that we do. Uh, we will start uh, uh, toward the end of April, a, a ad hoc uh, introduction to political economy course for uh, young economists from think tank here in Malaysia. It will be done uh, not in the way of traditional lectures, but distributing reading material to be interpreted uh, first. Uh, and so we will have not uh, traditional lectures, but conversation on reading materials concerning some topics. And we will have also quite uh, a lot of Lachman there. And uh, we hope that uh, Professor Vaughn could be our guest again in the future. Uh, we wish her all the best for, uh, for the book that Mercatus brought us uh, recently, and which I'm uh, reading in these days. Uh, it was a very enlightening conversation. I, I really envy your experience uh, during <laughs> the 70s and the 80s in that yeah. environment. And we will do our best to recreate that spark and that flame in this remote part of the world, God willing. Thanks, everybody. Thank and you. Have a good night or have a good day. And we will keep you posted with uh, other initiatives in the future. Thank you very much. Good night.